The world champion Pittsburgh Steelers were in St. Louis last week for a first-hand look at the NFL's latest rookie running sensation, Otis Anderson. Anderson had a chance to become the first player in history to gain over 100 yards rushing in each of his first three games. Against Pittsburgh, he once again displayed unusual quickness for a big back as he outflanked the steel curtain to give St. Louis an early lead. In their first regular season game against the Steelers since 1972, the Cardinals seemed unawed by the team of the decade. As number 17, Jim Hart took his business right down the middle to Mercurio Mel Gray. While the irreverent Cardinals romped to a shocking 21-7 lead, Pittsburgh returned to the realm of mere mortals with two fumbles lost and two Terry Bradshaw passes picked off. After three quarters of such behavior, the men in black finally said enough. The Steeler defense brought Anderson's NFL odyssey to an end by holding him to only 37 yards in 16 attempts. Then Bradshaw got off the mat and tied the game on two fourth quarter touchdown passes. That left it all up to Pittsburgh's place kicking pixie, Matt Barr. Little number nine calmly rammed home a 20 yarder with 18 seconds left for a 24 to 21 Steeler victory. On a day that St. Louis knew the upset of the young season had been ripe for the picking. Down in Dallas, the second best team in the world was also having trouble getting up. The Dallas Cowboys expected to kick the Chicago Bears all over the lot. But they hadn't counted on number eight Chicago quarterback Vince Evans. Evans threw for two long scores and ran for another. And suddenly, like the Steelers in St. Louis, the Cowboys realized they could be had. Dallas needed a spark to get started, and it was seemingly provided by a rookie kick returner from Howard University named Steve Wilson. Wilson scored on an 82-yard spectacular, but Dallas got more bad vibes when it was nullified by a clipping penalty. So the Cowboys regrouped around their leader, number 12, Roger Staubach, and his stable of thoroughbred receivers. Three times Chicago took the lead, and three times Dallas roared back to regain it. Tony Hill high-stepped home with less than two minutes left in the game to give Dallas a 24-20 lead. Then the doomsday defense finally zeroed in on Vince Evans. Last Sunday, Dallas and Pittsburgh demonstrated why they stand alone at the top of their respective conferences. On a day that precious little went right, they had still found what it took to win. Chicago and St. Louis had discovered that sometimes playing your very best isn't good enough. To beat an NFL champion, it helps to be good, lucky, and more than one touchdown ahead with a minute to play. For the first time in many years, the preseason experts picked the San Diego Chargers to finish on top in their division. 
to join the likes of Pittsburgh and Dallas as teams to beat in the NFL. The enthusiastic Chargers have met the challenge head on. However, it was the Buffalo Bills who dominated the action through most of three quarters. The Bills' potent offense featured an 84-yard touchdown pass from Joe Ferguson to Curtis Brown. But the ability to come from behind often separates the playoff contenders from the also-rans. Led by Clarence Williams, number 40, who gained 157 yards and scored four touchdowns, San Diego exhibited this must characteristic. The victory was a significant one for the Chargers. Their offense, normally led by the explosive passing duo of Dan Fouts and John Jefferson, relied on ball control to beat Buffalo, something San Diego must continue to do effectively to join the ranks of the NFL's elite. A big test will come at New England this week, so stay ready, Clarence. Your talented services will be in increasing demand. While the Chargers have justified their preseason ranking, the Detroit Lions have gone the other way. Injuries to quarterbacks Gary Danielson and Joe Ree left ninth round draft choice Jeff Comlow alone at the helm. The loss of Danielson, the acknowledged Lions leader, was the most telling blow. Without Danielson's experienced leadership, the young Lion offense has been knocked askew. Kamlo has performed capably, however, utilizing his under-publicized but fine tight end, David Hill, number 81. But Hill's rendition of the Motor City Shuffle was not enough to spark the lethargic Lion offense, which gained but 53 yards rushing against a mediocre Jet defense. With no running game to make use of, Kamlo was raw meat for the improving jet pass rush. Here led by number 99, rookie Mark Gastineau. While the Lion offense was floundering, the Richard Todd to Wesley Walker combination was dissecting the Lion defense. Todd's pinpoint strikes to Walker were good for 177 yards and made it possible for Kevin Long, number 33, to enjoy a three-touchdown afternoon. Jets did what the Lions have to do if they are to salvage respectability from a season already marked by disappointment. Detroit must solve an unsettled quarterback situation in order to achieve offensive stability and victory. With much preseason publicity centered on the Lions, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers went virtually unnoticed. They have remedied that situation in a hurry. A rapidly improving offense ignited by rookie Jerry Eckwood, number 43, is combined with a solid and dependable defense to make the nondescript Bucks a force in the NFC Central. Against the Green Bay Packers, the Bucks showcased the individual skills of their powerful defensive unit. Number 57, David Lewis, beat the containment, allowing teammate Leroy Selman, number 63, to recover the Packer fumble. But it has been the continuing maturity of quarterback Doug Williams, here recognizing a safety blitz and hitting Ricky Bell, number 42, in the open area, that has accounted for much of Tampa Bay's offensive success. Williams' growth, plus excellent outside speed in the backfield, has allowed the Bucks to more than double their three-game point production of a year ago. With three victories safely tucked away, no one can blame the Bucks for telling it like it is. What was the major topic of discussion last week in the Los Angeles Coliseum? 
Exciting new fall television schedule? Governor Jerry Brown's latest trip? No, it had to be Southern California's worst air pollution alert in recent memory. In broiling 97 degree heat, everyone was gulping for oxygen. While the Rams and 49ers met in the first annual California Smog Bowl. While Angelinos were nearly choking, the Rams certainly were not. Quarterback Pat Hayden completed passes to 10 different receivers as Los Angeles moved the ball well enough to hold back the pesky 49ers. Hayden chalked up two touchdown passes, including this one to tight end Charlie Young, number 86, as the Rams coughed and wheezed their way past San Francisco, 27 to 24. Weather may have been a factor in the smog basin, but there were no such problems in the climate-controlled New Orleans Superdome, where the Saints and their top-ranked offense sapped the Philadelphia Eagles with an Archie Manning to West Chandler bomb on the very last play of the first half. But the Eagles pulled off some classy passing heroics of their own as quarterback Ron Jaworski continuously found open targets like Charlie Smith, number 85. Also among the offensive heroes was Eagle running back Wilbur Montgomery, number 31, who rushed for nearly 100 yards and scored the first Philadelphia touchdown of the day. When Montgomery wasn't giving fits to the Saint defense, his understudy, number 37, Billy Campfield, was equally as troublesome. These two scores, plus four field goals from rookie kicker Tony Franklin, gave the Eagles a 26-14 win over the Saints. It helped ease the loss of all-pro linebacker Bill Berge, who will miss the rest of the season with an injury. In last week's other indoor game, the Seahawks and Raiders met in the Kingdom for an important AFC West encounter. The Seattle defense turned out to be downright inhospitable to its guests from Oakland. In the old days, it was the Raiders who meted out such punishment. Now it was the Seattle defense doing the battering and bruising, shutting out Oakland through two quarters and allowing only 10 points altogether. Meanwhile, the explosive Seahawk attack notched 27 points of its own to gain their first win of the season. Seattle has never had much problem putting points on the scoreboard, but the same cannot be said for their division rivals, the Denver Broncos. Last week, the Broncos journeyed to Atlanta to meet the Falcons, and somewhere along the way, Denver found something to punch up its attack. Whatever it was, it worked wonders in Georgia, as the Broncos piled up nearly 400 yards in total offense. Jim Jensen's 30-yard run up the gut was but one of Denver's long gains of the day. Others came through the air, thanks to circus catches from the likes of wide receiver Jack Dalbin, number 82. But while the Broncos were moving the football, so were the Falcons. Quarterback Steve Bartkowski pierced the normally airtight Denver defense for better than 300 yards and two touchdowns. After regulation time had elapsed, the game was deadlocked at 17 apiece. Denver won the toss to begin overtime, and that would be it. The Broncos marched right down without interruption, 
setting up the game-winning field goal by kicker Jim Turner. The 20-17 victory moved the Broncos into second place in the AFC West, while handing Atlanta its first defeat of the year. There was ample opportunity to send in the Clowns last Sunday. For a no less than six games, substitute quarterbacks directed their team's fortunes. In Houston, Gifford Nielsen emerged from the shadow of Dan Pastorini and started his first professional football game, as did Kansas City's Steve Fuller, number four, who spent most of the afternoon running for his life. Fuller, who nearly beat Cleveland in a relief role two weeks ago, was sacked repeatedly and intercepted four times in the Astrodome. With their offense grounded, Casey's only score of the day came on a punt return by J.T. Smith, number 86. Smith's exciting 55-yard sideline romp gave the Chiefs a momentary lead. Then Nielsen, the ex-Brigham Young star, brought Houston back, hitting 12 of 18 passes and one touchdown on a perfectly executed screen to Tim Wilson, number 45. For Houston, it was a welcome win without batter Dan Pastorini. For young Gifford Nielsen, it was a solid starting debut and a brief respite from the obscurity of the reserve quarterback role. Last year, when the Cincinnati Bengals lost injury-prone Ken Anderson, they were unprepared. Last week against New England, it happened again, but the Bengals were ready. They had drafted Jack Thompson number one. But against the Patriots, the highly touted throwing Samoan did more damage with his feet than with his arm. But the rookie quarterback's two touchdowns rushing were no match for the long-range bombing of veteran Steve Grogan of the Patriots. Rogan's flawless performance handed Cincinnati its third straight defeat and led the Patriots to a victory that was easier than the 20-14 final score would indicate. Tommy Kramer, the Minnesota Vikings' new starting quarterback, expects to throw the ball, not receive it. But against Miami, nothing went right for Fran Tarkenton's successor. His fumble led to the winning touchdown in the game that spotlighted the talents of six-year reserve quarterback Don Strzok. The value of an experienced second-string passer was demonstrated when Strzok subbing for Bob Greasy threw the clincher to Jimmy Cephalo, number 81. The Dolphins remained unbeaten, and Don Strzok maintained his reputation as one of the better backups in pro football. Baltimore's Roger Carr should have hidden his head in shame, for with Greg Landry again replacing injured Burt Jones, the Colts might have beaten the Browns had the Louisiana speedster held on to this perfectly placed pass. Led by Landry, the Colts offense was non-existent. Their only touchdown of the day came on this super special teams play by number 47, rookie Larry Brazil. Still, the Colts had the Browns beaten until late in the game. Then Brian Sipe, rapidly gaining a reputation as a quarterback who delivers with the game on the line, documented his coolness by hitting Dave Logan in stride for the touchdown that tied the game. Then from his own 10, Sipe threw to Ozzie Newsom in the flat, and the 235-pound Wizard of Oz turned on his sprinter's speed. 
74 yards later, Newsom was caught. But every one of the 72,000 in Municipal Stadium knew what was coming. For the third time in three games, Don Cockroft's field goal was the difference. As the unbeaten Cleveland Browns pulled out another last-minute miracle, 13 to 10.